Hey, happy Father's Day, guys. So a little dad story. Um, a couple months ago, I, was, I took Kate for a ride, and we had gone and gotten a drink, and we were riding around the lake, and uh, in the distance, there was a home being built, and she said, oh, Daddy, that is a beautiful home. I said, yeah, let's go check it out. And she goes, oh, yeah, for sure. And so I pull in, and I pull right up to the house, and in front of the house, there's this really big sign in red, and it says, no trespassing. And I go to get out of the car, and she goes, um... That says no trespassing. Is this like, are we? I'm like, oh no, that's fine. It's actually fine, Kate. They only put those signs in front of the houses they're building because if you get hurt, then you just can't sue them. But they don't mind you coming in. <laughs> now, here's the thing I didn't make that statement up, I learned that statement. I'd heard that statement before. Any idea where? Happy Father's Day. <laughs> My son's been learning how to drive for the past year. And our first trip on the interstate, he says, how fast can I go? I said, well, usually you can get away with five to 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. I didn't make that up. I learned that. You know where I learned that? Happy Father's Day. So like, here's the thing, I, I feel like there are some behaviors, there are some habits that we put on in life and then we come to a place where we actually need to unlearn them before we can put something else on. There is a process of sort of shedding some behavior before we can pick up a habit that might be better. And so all parents have knowledge of this, and it, it seems like we try our hardest to instill in the next generation what is necessary for them to be better than we were. And yet, it seems like we many times give them exactly what we are, right? Right? And then we get under the pressure of it and we get frustrated about it. There's nothing more frustrating than when you see something in your kids that is exactly what you put there. And as parents, it can be um, debilitating, almost depressing. But what if, what if on top of doing our dead level best to get it all right, in the process, we understand that we are not going to get it all right. And so since we are not going to get it all right, it should also be maybe more necessary that throughout our parenting that we, we do life in such a way that we're pointing them towards the one who can fix whatever we got wrong. The one that can actually help them unlearn the things that we mistakenly put in there. C.S. Lewis tells this little story in um, one of his books. And there's this young man named Eustace and he's absolutely obnoxious. He frustrates his family. He frustrates his friends. He just has this personality that is always trying to get this particular treasure that he wants, and he'll do anything to get it. And finally, he finds himself in this place where there the treasure is, and he puts on the golden bracelet that you're supposed to put on, and he falls asleep, and he wakes up a dragon. To get the treasure, he had to become a dragon. And sometimes we have these desires in us to have something, but in order to have the thing that we want to have, we have to become someone else. And in becoming someone else, we get the very thing that we want, but then we lost everything that we needed. When he became a dragon, there were relationships that were cut off all of a sudden. Friendships that he couldn't have anymore because who associates with a dragon? And then he found himself in this place where he just wanted to be fixed. He could not, quote, undragon himself. And so we have this moment in the story where the lion comes and 
hoax, his, the flesh of the dragon, and the lion undragons Eustace so that he can be the person that he was always intended to be. And as leaders, it maybe is our biggest responsibility to point people to Jesus, who is the only one who can do in them what must be done for them to become everything that God has called them to be. Maybe that's our most prominent responsibility as a dad, to not get everything right, but to get that right. Because once people find that place where they've kind of unlearned some things, now what? Now the gospel calls them to put some stuff on. Because the real work is taking the stuff off, but the real winning is in putting the stuff on. So the Apostle Paul gives us this laundry list of stuff that we put on in order to win at life. So let's check this out. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, there's a phrase here that I want us to just grab, and then we'll kind of see how to live this out. He says that there is a love that we're supposed to put on, because when we put that love on and we walk in that love, it will actually bind everything together in harmony. One of the the things that we need to understand our a calling, a purpose that we have in the world today, is we're supposed to be the ones that are creating the harmony. We are supposed to be the ones who are acknowledging when there is discord and finding the gospel answer and remedy and then speaking that voice that will create harmony in the world where we live. Have you ever found yourself on the way home and everything was going great, like awesome, and then you stepped in the front door and it's chaos? Just me. And then you have, a, you have a, an opportunity to either add to the chaos or to create harmony. What is the calling of a Christian? Create harmony, to live in harmony, to do what is necessary to bring people together. There is a togetherness that is intentional that's not going to just happen on its own. It's not going to be just a random, organic moment. Rather, it is something that we work towards. Those of you who are married, those of you who are in a relationship, harmony is work. Like you can can neglect something and have the facade of harmony, but if you want real harmony, it takes work to get there where both sides actually understand one another and because I realize that this offends you and because you realize that this offends me because I had communication with you and you had communication with me, we know each other and we choose based on the knowledge that we have to behave differently. That is creating real harmony. The facade of harmony is just one person being silent days or months or years, and then one day, we break our silence. No, we have been called to create harmony, real harmony. And that comes from a message. Like when I come home and I step into an environment and my kids are dealing with something, Am I going to help them deal with that or do I want to neglect what they're dealing with because I just want them to be quiet? We have an obligation as parents 
to be present at such a capacity that we actually understand what they're dealing with. Because when we understand what they're dealing with, we who are more mature, we in whom the word of Christ dwells in richly can take from that treasure and open up a gospel passage that is actually the answer for their battle. Because make no mistake, there's a battle. Every one of us, Every one of our children, we are in a battle. This thing called spiritual warfare, this gospel phrase, it's like a real deal. If I can just go old school for a moment, there is demonic opposition to the path forward of your children. There is demonic opposition to the path forward of your household. Your happiness, your peace, your provision, like there is opposition. And because there's opposition, there's a battle. And if there's a battle, then we all need to be one in facing the battle. But we can't be one facing the battle if we're not actually having the conversation. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 8 says, if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? Guys, gals, there's a battle. Are we helping the people around us prepare for that battle? You know, I think it's fascinating in this text. It talks about singing spiritual songs and hymns. A similar passage in Ephesians compares this to the, um, the joy of intoxication. Do not be drunken with wine where this is excessive, but be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, right? This psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So there is this moment when I can't be at peace because there's a flood of emotion against me. Maybe I'm 15 years old and I posted something and somebody made a comment on that that just ruined my day. I, look, I realize, I realize we can talk technology. It's not the day for it. But let me just throw this out there. It's not going anywhere. This is, this is not something that we're going to get away with just like never letting a piece of equipment in the house. At some point, they're going to get one. It might be, it might be a better option to teach them how to be responsible with this freedom rather than just eliminate it. So if I know that they're going to have something and I know that the something that they have has the potential to hurt them, then as a parent, it is my responsibility to see forward that there's going to be a battle and be able to say, now listen, there are going to be inputs into your life that I didn't have to deal with because I didn't have this certain technology. But let me let you know that because you are going to have inputs into your life and there are going to be naysayers and there's going to be criticism that I didn't have to deal with at the level that you're going to have to deal with, please understand what the gospel says you need to do. Because when you're faced with something that is not depression, but it sure feels like it. When you're faced with something that isn't insecurity, but it sure feels like it. When you're faced with something in your world that is tearing you down, let me just tell you, little precious one, there's a psalm and there's a hymn and there's a spiritual song that if you'll just sing from your heart and make that melody, I'm telling you what the enemy seeks to put on you, God will lift off of you. What is that? That is preparing them for the battle because the enemy can't win if I tell them what to use. But if the word doesn't dwell in me richly, I don't have the remedy. And if I'm not paying attention because I'm never there, I'm not even aware that there's a battle. Harmony is created. We create this harmony. Togetherness. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. says, do two walk together if they don't agree? Like, if I don't agree to walk with you, we can't meet up and walk. There is a responsibility in me 
to recognize what I need and then agree to be together with someone who can help me face that. There's a responsibility in me to create an environment of togetherness in my household and not an environment of just individual, individual pursuits. See, let me, just, let me just talk the world for a minute. Because here's a message of the world. The message of the world is this. You figure out your purpose, you figure out what you want, and then you go get it. That's what the world says. Yet the gospel says God has a plan for you, and he's going to place you in community so that in that community, together, you guys will accomplish the kingdom of God. The, the world's version is individualistic. The world's version is rebellious. The world's version is just me. God's version is us. God made all the beauty of the earth and the heavens. And then he looked at man. He said, this is good. This is all good. But it's not good that man is alone. And so he made a woman to be together with the man. And then when he saw that togetherness, what did he say? This is good. Why? Why did Jesus send his disciples out by twos? Because there is a power in togetherness. My job is not to look at the, the individuals in my household and say, you just go do your thing. My job is to say, how can we do this together? Because I need you and you need me. First Peter said, husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life. He says, if you have this, this uh, friction between the two of you, ask, ask for prayer. Pray your prayers. He's not going to answer them. Why? Because he's going to answer them together because the promise isn't just for you all by yourself. The promise is for you together. So if you're in a married household, the, the responsibility is not for you both to be doing your own thing, but rather for you to discover what it is that God puts you together to accomplish together. What can you do together? What can we accomplish together? And this is why he goes on to the next step and he says, you've got to learn to bear with one another. If you don't know how to bear with one another, you're not going to create harmony. If you don't know how to bear with one another, you're, you're not going to do anything together. Bearing with people, now there's work. There's work. I'm not talking about right and wrong. I'm talking about opinions. I have to bear with opinions, whether I agree with them or I do not agree with them, if that opinion is not in um, direct objection to the gospel. There are people who just like things differently than I do. My wife and I. We like things differently. Um, I, I, this would be my, if you want to know what my dream family room would look like. It might have a couch. It might have a TV mounted on the wall. And nothing else. Not a picture, not a plant, not a knick-knack, not a knick-knack in the house. Why we buy shelves that we don't need, lean them against the wall that we paid to paint, and then cover it all up with knickknacks, I'll never know. <laughs> Plants, let my dream yard, it's a house and yard. Just grass that goes right up to the house. I don't want bushes. I don't want flower beds. I don't want to have to maintain anything. I don't want to pull weeds. I want to mow and blow and go. That's it. <laughs> hey, hey. Ladies all out there watering stuff, planting stuff. Stop planting stuff. It grows. It's like kids. Quit having so many kids. I'm sorry. It does take two for those. <laughs> Only if a thing goes right, though. <laughs> Y'all are slow on that one. You'll get it later. Um, no, we have to bear with one another. There are texts that tell us when there are things that you don't agree on, but they're not spiritual things. You need to bear with one another. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 14 and verse 19. He said, so then let us, there's us, that togetherness, let us 
pursue what it is to make peace. It's going to take all of us pursuing what is necessary to make peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. For we know that everything is clean, but it is wrong if anyone causes another to stumble because of what he eats. So here they were having this environment where the one group wanted barbecue pork and the other group wanted chicken. This group that wanted pork said everything is clean so we can eat whatever we want to. This group wanting chicken said, nah, I've never eaten pork. I can't eat pork. This is really offensive to me. And Paul comes in and he says, look, food's not worth it. We find ourselves dying on hills these days that are not worth it. You, you think about how many disruptions at work, how many disruptions in a classroom, how many disruptions at home happen over stuff that just isn't worth it. Like, does it really matter? Well, is somebody taking this away from me? What have you lost? My mine. Your what? Like, we don't know. Bear with one another. He says, look, if you're around somebody that is offended by you eating pork, here's an idea. Don't do it. Just, just don't do it. It's not worth, he says, it's not worth destroying the work of God in them. I mean, there, there is the necessity for us to bear with one another. To bear with somebody, what I assume is that you're not doing something that's offensive to me on purpose. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 7 says that love believes all things and love hopes all things. Now this is complicated because when you do something that I don't like, it is the modern opinion to indict. It's the modern opinion to assign intent. You actually meant to do that to me. And because you did something that I don't like and you meant to do it, now, now I have a right to just go at you. I'm not bearing with people when I do that. Why don't I assume that they didn't actually mean harm? I know what we all say about assuming, but that's not what the gospel says. What the gospel says is you need to put on love, and it says love believes all things. It just believes the best in people. That they, that they didn't actually mean to do that. So let's bear with them and let's have a conversation that you can help me and I can help you. And then what happens? Now we have harmony. But we don't bear with one another. That's not going to happen. Now, the, the text here is not talking about tolerating wrong or tolerating sin. It's talking about bearing with one another. There's a difference. The same conversation about food was had in Acts chapter 15 and verse 29, and this is what the apostle said, abstain from anything that has been sacrificed to an idol and from blood and from anything that has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things, you do well. So when we talk about bearing with one another, what we're not talking about is tolerating sin. If there is something, no matter what it is, and it was offered to an idol, don't you eat it? Don't, don't let the next person eat it. Get rid of it. But if we're not talking about something that, is, that has been tainted because it's been offered to an idol, now we're not talking about right and wrong. We're not talking about sin and righteousness. What we're talking about is an opinion, and we bear with one another. We don't just assume that they meant to do that. For the last couple of weeks, my daughter's been going to the YMCA to swim, so I go with her. Um, I go, she goes, I go in the bathroom, I wash my hands, I go back out. I go to the bathroom, wash my hands, I go back out. This goes on for about an hour. Um, I've been doing this for weeks. The other day, I went to a different room, went into the bathroom, totally different color. I panicked because the bathroom was not the same color that the bathroom had been for the last two weeks. So I go run outside. I look at it, it says men. I'm in the right bathroom. Then I decide to go over to the bathroom I'd been using for the last two weeks right in front of the counter that everybody's watched me go in and watched me come out. Watched me go in, watched me come out for two weeks. I go check the sign on that door. Women. For two weeks, I've been using the wrong bathroom and nobody mentioned it. 
And you know, and I know what they're thinking. <laughs> Christmas party this year. Staff's all at uh, the restaurant. We're all around. My uh, niece, one of um, Pastor Reggie's granddaughters is there. And we're just all talking and carrying on. And all of a sudden, we hear a very loud commotion behind us, cackling, a uh, big, ah, it's just noise. We turn around, and there's Dad standing next to one of the staff members' wives. And he's just red as a beet and apologizing. And we have no idea what's going on. And then we realize what had happened. Pastor Reggie, thinking that this young lady was his granddaughter, leans in. to give his granddaughter a kiss on the cheek and to only realize that's actually not his granddaughter. So he jumps back, he turns red, he's aghast, he's embarrassed, we're all laughing. Why are we laughing? Because we know him. He, we know him. And we know he wouldn't do that, right? But we don't give that benefit to other people sometimes. Sometimes people make mistakes or they do something that they don't even think is a mistake, but it offends us and they don't even know that we, they have offended us. And rather and rather than us bearing with them, oh, it's a check mark against you. And here's the thing, when we keep putting check marks beside things and beside people, all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place where we object to authority, we object to submission, we object to camaraderie, we object to having to give something up in order to get something better, we object to anything that might seem like an infringement on my personal space, and now we no longer have harmony. And you say, yeah, but, but they meant to. Then what does it say? If there's a complaint, forgive them. So it doesn't matter what angle we take in this. It always brings us back to the same place, harmony. Every time. And, and like forgiveness, I'm not going to pretend that that's easy because forgiveness is work. It is like work. I got frustrated the other day. Some, some, some people get on my nerves. Just, just get on my nerves. And I have to work it out. I have to. Like, I have taken it as my burden as a human being to work it out. Not because I want to, but because the gospel demands it. So as just a matter of life, I've learned to work it out. And so the other day, I'm annoyed and I realize I need to go take a really long bike ride. I tell Ab, I'm gonna go for a ride. It's like 10.30. I go hop on my bike. I did not wear my earphones. I didn't bring a player. I knew I just needed to hear the sound of the crank while I was pedaling it, and I just needed to work it out. And so I started pedaling and pedaling and pedaling. You know when I finally worked it out? Mile 18. And there's some of you, that's nothing. Because you've been trying to work it out for 18 years. And here's the thing, let me just say, it's okay. It's okay. Forgiveness takes time. I understand we don't let the sun go down on our wrath. I understand that we are to, to forgive as we have been forgiven. I understand that in a moment Jesus forgave us. I get all that. But I also realize that in humanity, forgiveness is a process. But what happens to us many times is because we don't want to commit to the process of forgiveness, we actually just forget about it, never forgive them, and then we see somebody 10 years later, and when we see them, we immediately remember, I can't stand you. Why? Because I never fixed it. I never, I never fixed it. We cannot carry the burden of unforgiveness. We can't. It's not worth it. 
Like, I don't care what you need to do. You need to go take a run. You need to go take a trip. You need to, go, you need to do whatever you need to do. But you need to go ahead and, and just submit to a process where you forgive who needs to be forgiven. There are some of you, you're in marriage two or three, and you're causing friction in your current now marriage because you haven't forgiven things from the first one. And that baggage of that, you're just dragging with you. It's not worth it. It's, it's not worth it. Some of you, you're in your first, your only marriage, but you're dragging baggage from your household, your home of origin, and you're placing all that in the middle of your now, and it's not worth it. We have to forgive. We have to put off so we can put on. We can't put on love over top of unforgiveness. It doesn't fit. We have to take off the unforgiveness and put on love. And when we put on love, there's a willingness to bear with one another. When I've gone through the work of forgiveness, bearing with one another is nothing. And the reason why is because I don't want to carry this anymore. And because I don't want to get here where unforgiveness is just blinding, I'm willing to bear with you. Why? Because it just makes life easier. The gospel is not supposed to make life hard. You know, here's where sometimes we get it wrong. We think Jesus came to earth to show us how to be God. That's not it at all. Jesus came to earth to show us how God would do human. He gave us the example of how to live human, of how to do this. We see him on the cross. And what did he say? Forgive them. Because they don't even know what they're doing. What if that's our posture? Do you realize the harmony that we would create in our households? Do you realize the momentum that would happen in our teams when we are leading from a position of love and harmony rather than discord and friction? Can, can you imagine what our community would look like? Maybe, maybe that's too big of a goal right now. So why don't we just look at this? Why don't we just see it in our house? Why don't we just see it in our church? Why don't we start there and watch God do something miraculous in our community? No matter what you do, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God.